Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Coach's Corner. I'm Sive. I'm standing in for Vesper tonight. Tonight, our coaches are going to have a conversation with Duke Kern of Trimeris. It's going to be a good time. Uh, make sure to remember to drop any questions you have down in the Facebook comments, and these guys will do their best to get to everything they can. So I think that is all of the business. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Duke Sean. Hey, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah. Happy to have everybody. Um, looking forward to a great conversation with his Grace Kern uh, from Chimeris. Um, and uh, tonight we're joined by uh, his Grace Branos and Sir Rifkin and Vicanus Bess. Uh, some of our coaches. I'm looking forward to, to hearing some of the questions they, they might have from it as well. Um, His Grace Kern just recently stepped down during the Rona years um, as uh, as king. He was king before the pandemic uh, happened uh, and then uh, stood in a lot longer than, uh, than he should have had to expect um, to kind of help transition things over. Um, and um, so we're really happy to have him. Uh, so, uh, Kern, yeah, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, I'm Sir Kern. <laughs> uh, Kern O'Farrell. I've uh, been fighting uh, for about uh, 30 years now. So um, I think if you fight that long, you pick something up and <laughs> you get decent at it. So, uh, uh, but I'm in Trimaris and uh, my uh, formative years were uh, spent just having fun with my, my fighting household. And uh, I continue to do that. Um, actually, I was a, a baseball coach when I found the FCA. I was coaching a baseball game um, in the public park because uh, you were only allowed to do so many uh, official practices in the, uh, the field that was the school. So we kind of circumvented that by voluntarily meeting in the park. And that's where I met uh, my, uh, the person who became my knight, uh, Duke Llewellyn. And uh, um, I know we have some really good teachers with us right now, uh, but I would put my night uh, in the same category as uh, some of you and some of the best. And uh, Hey, talking about that, talking about uh, Llewellyn, um, how's he doing? I haven't uh, seen him in, in a bit. I fought him. Uh, well, he's doing great. He's, he does some other hobbies. Um, uh, he uh, uh, enjoys uh, other competitions and... Uh, um, but he stays in shape every once in a while. He puts on armor. I went down to visit him a, about a, a month or so ago. Uh, I always try to visit him at least during the summer. And he comes out to like one or two events uh, a year, I would say. And uh, uh, he's still got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, last time I saw like him at Golf Wars. He was, yeah, he was he's, uh, he's still got it. It's kind of like when I used to fight, uh, you know, my dad was a boxer. And, uh, you know, he taught me some boxing when I was young. But I, baseball was my, my main sport. And it didn't matter. I think it was the psychological thing of, uh, uh, of, you know, your dad, he could always take you, you know, and I don't know what it is about Llewellyn. He's always had my number, maybe because he trained me. Although I think my style has changed a ton um, since I started tr stop training under him. Um, uh, you know, I, I have uh, been very fortunate to have a lot of good teachers. Uh, uh, Llewellyn first, uh, Sir Terrell, uh, Duke Solomon, uh, Duke Baldar, um, Shosai, uh, you name it. I was a sponge and uh, they all enjoyed uh, tattooing their names on my offside body, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, uh, I, I, I soaked it up and uh, for everything I could get. And uh, it was, it paid off, you know, I paid my dues, <laughs> you know, you pay your dues, um, but they were also good teachers. They weren't too abusive. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, and, and it's great because you know it used to be around Shosai and Llewellyn and and those guys are awesome, awesome folks. You had a you had a great crew to step in. I really did step in and play with. And what what year was that? So I started in ninety one. This is my thirtieth year, and uh, you know I think that uh, the SCA fighting during that time started to become uh, it, it improved a lot. And I think it's taken another step in the last four to five years. 
when it comes to the ability to teach others. Uh, you know, the video, video access is the video that we have now is, has changed my fighting. You know, it's, uh, it's had a huge impact on me. Um, but, uh, you know, my formative years were, were, I, I was lucky to have access to such good fighters. So, so um, you know, I, it's kind of funny. We, we hang out on Tuesday nights all the time, you know, on uh, great fighters of uh, YouTube. Um, you know, one thing I, it's, it, it's always fun watching you go hang out on Nepal and try everybody's shots. It, is that something you did like at the very beginning is like you saw a cool shot, you went and tell you know, smash. So wow. When I when I think of my fighting, I am the farthest thing from a Zen fighter that you can imagine. Uh, I am a playbook fighter. So I, I have a, a playbook of shots and, and I have a pretty large repertoire. I think most fighters that have been fighting for 30 years would have a pretty large repertoire. Now, do I use them all the time? Uh, probably not. I've probably forgotten, <laughs> you know, uh, a large number of those shots or when I use those shots. But I, I, I use my playbook. And of late, I've, I've started to apply strategy with the playbook. Um, but yeah, I've always, uh, you know, tried new shots. And a lot of the things I have come up with, on uh, not a lot, several things I have come up on, on my own. You know, the the best thing that was ever taught to me was the wavy rising. And uh, everything I do is, the, it's the font of everything I do. And one of the things I, I've noticed about uh, watching video and listening to you, and there was a, a video, uh, when I knew it was gonna be on here, I started watching some, of, some more of the Coach's Corner. And the one that I, I really enjoyed, I think I got the most out of was the one on footwork. And when you had come down for a class that you did, you were talking about using gravity to fall in your seat as you're retreating. And uh, the drop step, I think as Tristan was talking about. And these are things that I was doing, but either I wasn't aware or I didn't know how to describe it. And those are things that I've gotten from watching video. Even the, the offside pump back cut, you know, I got from watching Arminius uh, back about 10 years ago, you know, and, you know, so I've, I'm, I love watching fighting. It's not just, and it doesn't matter if it's in person, you know, I see somebody do a shot, I want to take it. And I'm always, wor I, I work it out on the pell. Uh, and, uh, but I'm always, even in MMA, you know, the footwork in MMA, I'm always, I love watching fighting. I used to, I used to really enjoy watching boxing. And some of my friends will say, you're not a, a true, you know, uh, MMA is not a pure thing, you know, and I'm like, I love it. <laughs> you know, there's something about watching MMA that just, which, which is similar to our game because it's one shot and you're done. And, and that is one of the things I love about our game. If it was a, a beat down, I'm pretty sure some of these giant guys out there would have their ways with us. But uh, because we're playing, it's a sport aspect and we have rules. Um, anyone or, you know, that, that dedicates himself, I think can, can improve. But yeah, I did. I, I've always tried to copy what I see that I think is, is useful in every situation. And I just, I really work it on the Pell. And I also make the Pell, one of the things that I try to promote with other people is one, get a Pell. All right. Two, make sure that you're hitting the Pell with someone who knows what they're doing. That really a makes a difference. And then uh, make the Pell virtual. You know, the Pell could be 10 steps that way. But in my fantasy world of fighting, when I do this move, I'm expecting this person to respond in a certain way. And if they do everything I want them to do, then I want to be in this position where I can land the shot. So I'll, I'll make the Pell virtual. And that is, to me, you know, when they, when they don't do what I want them to do, I abort. And that's what good fighters do. Or we, we adapt, you know, we, we change. But when they do what we want them to do, that's that's game over. And when you do get to that position, you want to be able to deliver the shot. And so I practice my footwork moving to the Pell and I probably spend when I do hit the Pell and I hit the Pell a lot. I hit the Pell a lot. I, I love hitting the Pell. <laughs> so, um, but I spend probably, I would say, 
I would even say maybe 90% of it with, with my footwork and moving in and moving back um, instead of just throwing shots. I've been doing it for 30 years. I know how to throw a flat snap. I do. I still work religiously on footwork because the legs are the first to go. <laughs> I think, I think Bess has a question for him. Sure. So Kern, you're leading right into it and I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so your dad was a boxer and you say that you're focusing on footwork. Uh, I'm in a practice right now where we're focusing a lot on incorporating a lot of boxing style footwork into practice. And I'm wondering if your dad worked or if you picked up stuff from your dad and you're using boxing style because you say that you like to practice your footwork. So what exactly does that mean? Okay, so when I, when I think of boxing, my, my footwork, uh, you know, defining terms, you know, knowing what a gather step is, knowing what a crescent step is, knowing what a, um, a crossing step, those are things that um, my dad probably taught me when I was younger, but because I was playing baseball, I didn't really follow it as much. Later on, when I started doing, you know, sword fighting, and I realized that I didn't know how to fight when, um, when I started slowing down. And I had to learn to fight. It was, I was a knight for years when, when I finally realized that I, I didn't know how to fight. You know, I relied on my speed, but, um, you know, boxing in that regard, you know, I talked to my dad and, uh, he's going to be 90 in a week and he's still coherent. And, uh, we talk about my fighting and he loves hearing about it. And I show him videos and things like that. But with respect to boxing and even MMA, uh, the thing that I have tried to incorporate, and this goes along with the idea of strategy versus a playbook, the jab. The yeah. jab is something that has changed my fighting. And the first person that I ever saw that had a jab in the SCA and that I, I realized what he was doing was Duke Gregory of Trimeris. And it's probably because of, of, of proximity. I'm not saying that other people haven't done it, but he was the first person. And I don't use his jab just because I don't have the physical tools he has. His was an offside back cut. He can throw the offside back cut effortlessly, just, and it's smooth and he can do it all day. And so with respect to the ideas of boxing, um, you know, my Moline is my jab. Um, I, I fight with a, an A-frame uh, sword foot forward guard and my hand is high. I hold my hand, at times it might dip down to my shoulder, but I hold it, you know, chin to ear high and gravity is on my side. And from here, I can effortlessly throw my Moline. I can do it over and over again. And so with respect to boxing and watching um, uh, fighters, that's part of the strategy part that I, that I use. Um, um, and I, I think that that doesn't come until you have a good grasp of the basics. You know, you have to be able to throw that Moline without thinking. You have to be able to throw certain shots. I mean, I can if I wanted to maybe do the offside, but I was better at the Moline than the offside. I've always been better at the uh, Moline than the offside shot. And I think that if I could choose between the Moline and the offside shot, I would probably choose the offside shot because it takes more work and effort to do it. And it's more deadly. Uh, but this is what, <laughs> this is what I got, <laughs> you know, but the jab is, is paramount in that regard. So. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, Misty. Yeah. Um, so you talked about loving pell work. I think a lot of people um, that work on the pell have a hard time finding it fun or finding ways to make it engaging. How do you do that for yourself? So I, uh, how to make it fun. I, I try a lot of stupid stuff on the pell, all right? And uh, so I have a, a video group, uh, a private one with a, my, my great friend, Sir Tarek. Um, and we created this and we started using uh, video to share ideas. Um, and anyone that's in our household is automatically. And we have a couple other nights and uh, other people who said, can I please get on the, the video group? And we share videos. Originally, we were doing it um, in Messenger, I think, or I can't remember what it was. But then we moved it to a Facebook group. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, to me, it's exciting to say, hey, what do you think of this? And, 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 and share it with my friends and, and then. Tarek always brings me back to reality. <laughs> and he says, uh, uh, you know, Kern, that's too fancy. So I, I'm pretty primarily, uh, primarily a, a fake fighter. You know, I'm a, a BC range fighter. I, I think that the, 
Uh, and it's also, I've changed. I used to think that I was primarily a C range fighter. And now after I've analyzed a lot of my fights, yes, I like C range, but I, I get most of my kills at B range because the, your proximity and you can, when you're at C range, you have to reach too far and you can't reach far enough out. So I, I've transitioned that thought and Tarek has helped me realize that to some degree. Um, but so I love sharing what, I, what I'm working on and we all kind of share on there. I, I will be honest, I've probably put 90% of the videos on there and some of my friends laugh at them um, and that's fun for me, but I don't know why I like the Pell because I, I, I win when I fight the Pell every time, <laughs> you know? Um, I, uh, uh, it's, it's a treat for me. I, I don't hit the Pell until I've done my cardio and my, uh, my weight training first. And then, because if it wasn't for the, uh, if I, I could skip that and just hit the pell, and then I know that would have a negative effect on me overall. But, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was a kid and I was in my parents' house, my parents have a very eclectic um, uh, way of decorating. And they had this statue of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, which were actually liquor cabinets. <laughs> they were really cool wooden yeah. statues. And so, of course, Don Quixote had a spear. And there was a mirror at the far end of the house. And I would take that thing and I would practice these stupid, you know, uh, what do you call the um, Star Wars kid? <laughs> you remember the Star Wars kid video? That was me right there until I broke the spear and I had to glue it back. My dad never told me he knew until he was, yeah, I knew you broke the spear. And I was like, okay, whatever. But, you know, um, you know, I, I, I have fun because it's, it's, it's all about, you know, look, I want to fight well. I want to fight well. I want to do well. Um, I fear sucking, but what I fear more is um, uh, fear sucking. That right? What I fear more is the idea that if I'm if I'm still able to fight, and if I don't train, I, I know that my skills and my ability to fight would really diminish. And I want to be able to fight, even if I'm not fighting in crown. I want to be ready in case I change my mind, you know. And uh, I want to be ready to fight in that tournament. In case I change my mind, I want to be able to go up to the East Kingdom like I did last week and had a phenomenal practice up there and feel like I'm not going to go up there. And, you know, I, I want to it's important to me to fight well and to fight within where I'm capable. There's people that can beat the crap out of me. But as long as I'm, you know, improving, I'm trying new shots and creating new shots. That is that is what brings me enjoyment. And I will say that my style has it, it, I think it's. Uh, it takes longer. It took me longer to achieve uh, um, the point where I'm at because it's a fake uh, style. And the, there's pros and cons to that. It's really good when you're fighting someone you've never fought before. All right. And I love faking someone out of their socks. I love that. All right. But there's a flaw in that. Right. If you are a, uh, 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 a fake fighter you're relying on your opponent to make a mistake. Uh, if you're a, if you're you know a, a, field, a footwork fighter or a position fighter, you're taking that advantage. And I understand that. And I, I listen. I'm not a I'm not a one trick pony. I can do those things as well. But I get enjoyment out of faking somebody. That's I love that. You know, just like in the movies. <laughs> you know, and and that's probably why I'm here because I loved watching the you know, the sword fighters in the movies. And in and, and that regard, I'm, I'm pretty simple, you know? So, but I think we probably all can identify with that to some degree. Yeah, you know, Kern, uh, hearing you talk about your love of pell work, um, you know, we we met when I came down for uh, Tremaris, uh, Duke University. Yeah. Great class. Um, and uh, you were already a Duke at that point. And Actually, I think I was a count. Or maybe um, was a I don't know. I thought you were. Yeah, you were you're already do. Okay. Um, and, and one of the things that I picked up on on with working with you right off the bat was how much uh, you really just I mean, with somebody who wants to be one of the one of the best fighters in the world and you know, you fear sucking and all that, um, you were so uh, so easy to work with. Like you you just enjoy learning about our sport. Um, and oh, you yeah. were just uh, just just so invested in in learning more and seeing how how other things how people do it other ways um 
and you know we've had a chance to work a couple of times uh, since then i know you've you've hit me up and said how do you how are you doing this shot or how do we do this oh, and yeah. you know got a chance to work at a at Australia. so how do you uh for somebody that has had because you've had two reigns since we met um and actually i think you won the crown right after i was down there um uh, so how do you you know how do you keep that love you know it's what octa refers to as the beginner's mind you know, how do you keep that love for, um, you know, just just being and uh, being a sponge and being an open book and, and always wanting to always wanting to learn more? Um, I don't. Why do I want to learn more shots, <laughs> more technique and strategy? I don't um, I, I don't know how I keep the love. I just, uh, you know, one day I know that I'm going I think it's because I want to stay competitive and there are some shortcuts that we probably take as we get older. Um, but I think that the reason why I do it more now is so that I can become a better teacher. Uh, it, it's, you know, terminology, you know, just, there's so many different terminologies for just simply something like ABC range. And there, there are people that, uh, still use, um, you know, one, two, three sometimes as, <laughs> as range. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, I I, I love going to other places. And lately, my 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 true interest is, or my you know it, what gets me the most is going to other places, like you said, and learning from them. Um, I don't know if I could put a figure on why I I love it so much. I just do, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, it brings me joy to to learn something new, uh, you know. And it, something is subtle. It can be really subtle. Like when I first learned. Um, uh, I was watching a, a video by uh, Duke Sheridan. It was called the uh, Re uh, Rattan Combat Symposium, and it was a CD, right? Yeah, and I was like, was... and I, I heard about it, and I was like, I'm getting it. So I got my CD. And I was watching uh, uh, Duke Duncan, who was from Monstura, who came to Trimeris. And he was doing this shot, and I couldn't recreate it. I'm like, it's simple. And then I actually – I go to Gulf Wars the next year and I see one of his uh, squires was a knight uh, and it was Tomas. And I said, Hey, what is he doing? He's like, I don't know. Cause that wasn't what he was teaching. I know it wasn't what he was teaching. You know, how was he doing what he was talking about on the side? And it was something as simple as bend your knees. That was it. And so those little things, learning those little things that can help me explain it. So, so recently I had a very honest discussion with our King, uh, King Martin about, um, my power level when I'm throwing. And it was something that, uh, um, you know, you're, you're a couple of things. One, your, your opponents deserve good rattan, right? You don't want that to be a reason to think that they're missing it. Armor works. Okay. Um, so how do, how do I get up there? I'm not the biggest, strongest guy. So we had a, a really, you know, heart to heart conversation and I, 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 I asked for it. You know, I said, Martin, Martin's a strong guy and his technique is impeccable. And, uh, um, and, you know, so we went over about, you know, hitting the Pell cause I'm a Pell guy and I, I get a lot of my training from hitting the Pell and I, and so we spoke about chambering and as we were, uh, you know, compartmentalizing, um, the shot, uh, because it's easy when you're doing a jab. To, to just tap, right? It's easy to do that shot. You know, the back cut flip, like Gregory. Greg's a big, strong guy. He's 200, I don't know, you know, 50 pounds. <laughs> you know, he's got the mass behind it. I don't quite have that much mass. Maybe now I'm getting closer, but I can, you know, I don't want that to be just a, you know, ignored shot. I want them to take it seriously. So I was talking about power. So he was saying, comp com you know, comp compartmentalize it so that you can, Make sure you're engaging the hip. Make sure you're engaging the shoulder and the torso is twisting. All those little things. And then I started thinking about um, uh, adding in there the idea of gravity, throwing and dropping into the shot, rising up into the shot. Those are things that I probably was doing, but I got lazy with. Yep. And, uh, you know, watching videos and talking with people and and then the other thing I did recently was I intentionally put tennis grip on my sword, cut a little bit narrow, put tennis grip on it, and I'm not feeling the impact. And that bothers me. I want to feel the impact. 
So I went to a fighter practice after about three weeks of, of, uh, of doing some of the drills that Martin had talked about compartmentalizing. And, and uh, the person unprompted said, you're hitting like a truck. And, um, and the reason I remember thinking, I'm not, I'm not feeling the shot. And that, that grip that absorbed that tennis grip really absorbed a lot of the power. And, uh, no, you know, on, on a point, and, and this is interesting because yeah. somebody on, uh, uh, in our comments mentioned yeah. this to me before, and then we we're just talking about, you know, it, it helps. And you can see this in boxers, MMA guys all the time. If you're at a great practice, you tend to become great oftentimes. And, you know, what, what happens there is, you know, you, you're competing at a level that is so much higher that it's just normal for you. We have, me and Ron Galder complain about this all the time. We're like, we're trying to break 20 years of bad habit of movement and, and things like that. And, but, and, and really, you know, try, it takes us an incredible amount of effort to remember what to do. And then new people come in and they're doing it in like, you know, three practices and you're, you just look at them and you're like, God dang it. But, you know, so they're, they're, they're starting with good stuff right away. Right. And, and, that's what happens at a really high level practice uh, or, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's SCA or boxing. We see that all the time. Big characters come out of big gyms at, and because they're fighting champions all the time. Um, I, I think the key is, and you brought it up, and I think this is a big one for everyone, uh, is sometimes you have to go out and look for it. It's like, that's the shot, but I can't get it. And then you, you went out and found him and, and, like, okay, what do you do here? And it's as simple as bend my, you know, bend your knees. Yep. And, and that's, you know, I think that's the part that people miss. There's, there's effort. It, it's, it's not, it's not only that physical effort of going to practice, but there's a lot of mental effort in there as well. And, and when you are just not feeling comfortable with something, and I'm going to tell you, even if you are feeling comfortable with something that somebody else does go find them because they may show you a better way to still do it. You know, oh, yeah. uh, the, the, the one good thing that happens on a, a, at a great practice as well. And again, this, this is, you can go out like you have and find them is people will tell you, you know, Hey, you're being a little lazy. Legs are straight, not dropping into your shots. Mm -hmm. uh, your legs are straight. So you're, you can't pull, pull energy from the ground. Um, you know, you lose movement, you, uh, you're leaning forward, you're leaning backward. All of these little things get resolved when you have people at practice that, that know you enough and that are good trainers or champions in, in boxing case and things. Um, but not everybody has those. So I, I just want to, you know, I, I want to point out that, you know, not only did you do that, but you still do it. And I, I think time. it's important for the audience to, to know, you know, it's, uh, you, there's, Everyone's out there. I mean, I don't think you probably met anyone that said, no, I don't want to show you that shot, right? No, never had that happen. Not no. once. Never. You know, I mean, because I have, I'm, I, I'll, I'm a talker. <laughs> you ask some of my friends, I'm a talker. And uh, I have no fear of going up and asking for, for help. You know, like what's the old uh, saying that, you know, men don't ask for directions when they're lost in a car. I always ask for I, no hesitation. Like, what did you do? How did you do that? Why did you do that? You know, no, no hesitation. Um, sometimes it makes me look like, uh, you know, uneducated in that regard with respect to what we're talking about. But, and, and, I'm, and I probably need to be taught something multiple times. Like whenever I see Llewellyn, I always, every single time I see him, I always have him reteach me the wavy rising. Even though he has it down how he teaches it, Every once in a while, I pick up something new. Something new, yeah, yeah. So, and and Karen, I think that's what I was kind of picking up on when we first met. Is is like that thing that you have that where you allow yourself to be dumb, and you allow yeah. yourself to ask those questions, and you allow yourself to 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 say, you know, show me more, and 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 to not assume that um, that that you just you just know everything. And really, oh, after wow. having a certain amount of success in our sport, it it gets kind of difficult to be able to to allow oh yourself gosh, to, to, to be, to be dumb again. So yeah. um, I think uh, Bess had a question for you too. I'm going to throw that sure. at her. I do, but I just want to address something that you said. 
you know, that, oh, maybe it looks, makes you seem uneducated if you're asking questions. Well, maybe that wasn't the right words, but, but with, but with respect learning, to the sport, but, you know. But what a compliment to somebody to say, you know, hey, I'm a Duke, but you've got something that I would like, you know, can you show me that? So earlier you said, uh, you know, you're kind of afraid of looking goofy or whatever at a tournament type of thing. But I think, I think that's an incredible compliment that you can give somebody to say, hey, you've got something, I think it's really neat. And I'd like to pick up on that. So can you help me? So that's just a little aside. Sure. One of the things that uh, we've been talking about a little bit here on Coach's Corner in the past, and Bron has touched on the mental game tonight. So I, uh, I, I'm asking a lot of people this. I think I know your answer. Baranis describes himself as a very analytical fighter. Uh, he's constantly analyzing the fight and looking at the person in front of him and, and what are they doing and how are they moving. Uh, Sean describes himself sort of like that, but also an instinctive fighter moving. He's not, well, we're all consciously, well, we're all processing the information. Baranis processes consciously. Sean, maybe less consciously. How do you view yourself? How do you view how you view the fighting? I would probably say that uh, probably more towards like Sean. Um, I, I don't think I can just generally look at someone's uh, stance or, or what they're doing and say, oh, this is the strategy and just analyze it perfectly. I think sometimes it happens organically when I'm fighting, uh, but it's, it's, uh, uh, lately I have been trying to identify in my opponents, uh, like patterns. Like I, I do try to do that some, but it's not like a, uh, a technique or stance pattern. Like, um, for example, I was in, uh, the, the crown before, uh, this last one that I won, I was in the semifinals and, um, I was fighting a fighter who was very good. And I realized that he was just as tired as I was. And so I, and I had a few inches on the guy. So I went to my jab and I could tie because when you think of like, this is where strategy versus playbook or, or, or comes in. And when you think about um, the energy that it takes to fight and where you put your energy in a fight, when you're throwing a, uh, a, your, your effortless shot, your jab, that's nothing. But a person that knows you have it, they have to respond. And I think that the responding to your shots takes more energy than it does for me to throw. So I realized there was a point where I watched that, but I ended up being successful and lost in the finals because the guy who I fought was just, I don't think anybody could have beaten him that day. He knocked me in, a, in, the, in the loser's bracket. Um, but uh, I watched the fight and there was, this sounds like I was wasting energy, but I really wasn't. There was a point where I had thrown 20 shots and he had thrown like three or four. At the end of the fight, I had thrown 40 shots and he had thrown maybe 10, 12. And he was, he was this, he was, he was using so much energy just to play defense. And I was just having fun with him. And so being able to pick up on that, I fought somebody this past weekend uh, up in uh, East Kingdom, um, big giant guy. And uh, um, uh, he's on our, our great fighters, really good basic techniques. His name is Hawken. And oh, yeah. He asked me, he goes, uh, what, did you, what did you see? We, we spoke about it afterwards. And I realized right away, he was trying to throw these slot shots and then trying to go deep offside. And I don't know how I picked up on it, but I was, it wasn't like I was looking to see what his plan was, but somehow he telegraphed it. And the reason I know to look for this now is because, so we have in Trimaris, we have a, a really good uh, teaching forum called Duke University. Both of you guys have been there. So is Duke Drake. We invite, uh, we, we have a fundraiser and we invite the best fighters we can find or the best teachers we can find. And Duke Drake uh, on Sierra, he came out there and I'd never thought about it this way, but he does, he throws the slot shot, right? And he does this so you tighten up and then he goes offside. Exactly. Right? And so something happened. And I told, I said, it was pretty obvious you were trying to slot shot me to go offside. 
And I think he led with a deep offside and then came in. And so whatever it was, he was, listen, he's going to get me sometimes with it. I knew that. But just being aware of what someone's strategy is or what their plan is, that's, that's a game changer, you know? So um, I don't know if that answered your question correctly or not, but. <laughs> there is no oh, right yeah. answer, but it's a good okay. answer. So thank you. Right. So I have yeah. a question for you. Uh, one yeah. of the things that we discussed and we'll be discussing is crown fighting and preparing for crown. So you were describing a crown where you didn't win. So my question for, it's a two point question is, how do you center yourself for crown? So you're getting ready for crown. How do you center yourself or calm your nerves down, however you wanna say it? And then you describe this fight that uh, this guy went on to win. So you know that you're not going to win, how do you maintain your focus during a boat like that? Well, I mean, once I know I'm, I've lost, I don't have to maintain my focus anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's a, um, uh, so I am the poster child for if you fight in enough crowns, you'll eventually hopefully win some. Maybe that's not a fair thing to say. I, I, I definitely, uh, um, training does make a difference. Um, but, uh, you know, every crown that I fought in, there's been something different about it. The first time I fought in crown, I was in the best shape and I ran circles around everyone. The second crown I was in, I was in the worst shape and I fought the smartest fight I had, I had ever fought at that point. I thought about what I was doing in every single fight because I wasn't in shape and I knew I didn't have the energy. Um, the third crown was just for fun. And I was so relaxed. Um, the crown after that was, so I've been in seven finals and, and I've won four. Um, and uh, the two recent crowns that I fought in, I won the, the, the latter and the, the former, I, I was in the semis. And, but since I started winning, I'm so much more relaxed. And so I remember I was sitting watching a crown and I was so frustrated because I wanted to fight, all right? I am more comfortable fighting than watching fighting. Uh, you know, than, than watching a tournament. It, I just can't relax. And I was sitting watching uh, a crown that uh, uh, Count Vincent won. And I was sitting with my good friend, Tarek, and we were watching the crown. I'm like, do you like fighting crown? He's, and he's finaled in, in East Kingdom crown. He's, he's a phenomenal fighter. Um, and I said, he goes, yeah, it's nerve wracking. And I'm like, really? And I looked over my shoulder and, and uh, Duke Anton, I think he just, is he still king of uh, Atlantia or did he step down? Uh, he stepped anyway. down. Uh, okay, he's so just, he just recently, well, yeah, he just recently stepped down. Okay, so uh, he was sitting behind me with Bryce De Byron. They had come down to see Forgall's uh, daughter, Ambra, um, get elevated. And uh, so he said, so I turned around, and I go, Do you guys like fighting in Crown? And Bryce is like, Nah. And, and Duke Anton was like, Love it. And that's me. I love yeah. the challenge, love it. You know, it's, there's something, and, and don't get me wrong. There's another tournament we have down here called the champion of Trimeris, which I've only won once. It is the, I think it's harder to win that tournament than it is to win crown. And maybe it's because of my mindset. Um, you know, I, I, maybe because I've won it a couple of times, I feel like I, have, I don't have anything to prove. And I feel like I still, every time you enter champion of Trimeris, you have something to prove. Right. Um, so there's a difference there, but uh, uh, you know, I, if you fight enough crowns, you, you figure them out. I don't know what my plan. So I will say this, that, you know, I, I have some friends, like my former uh, squire is a Duke now, Thorsten. Um, he uh, reigned three times here in Trimeris and once in, 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 in uh, Meridiace. And I used to ask him, how do you get ready for crown? And, you know, because he was like, he would enter crown. And he's like, I know I won. He knew he won beforehand. I have never been that way. I, I know that I, I'm going to fight good. I never... I remember one time I went to a crown and I, I told my squires to curse at me and I was playing hard rock music in the car and I wasn't going to talk to anyone. And I get there and next thing I was, I'm, hey, hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> you know, and it's, I don't know what it is. I can't, I can't do that. I, that's not me. And um, so I don't know. I just fight the best fight I can. And wherever the, you know, the dice roll, that's where it goes. Um, I don't know if I have a mentality other than, constantly training and being ready just in case that's that's my training method just in case because you never know when a king might need you to to be a champion fight or something like that and i want to be ready for that too 
So really yeah, we, cool. we, we talked about that a little bit with uh, Alan on last week, you know, and he was kind of talking about the fact that, you know, if you're, if you go to crown and you put on your headphones and you try to stay away from everybody, it's like, well, that's not what you're doing at practice to, it's not. To, to get ready for that. So that's not, you know, like you said, that's not who you are. No. Um, and when like any time you go into crown and you try to be something other than who you are, that yeah. is a recipe for disaster. That You're is right. that just does not work. Uh, Rifkin's got some questions for you too. Sure. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is to, going from like um, your beginner's mind, like student mindset into a crown mindset and they don't know how to make the switch. How do you make the switch since that's sort of what you love to do? Well, I don't have to make a switch because it's what I love to do, but what um, I, I think your, your, uh, your mindset within, I, I don't know, it's easy for me to get a mindset for crown. I don't know how I turn it on. Um, I guess because it's comfortable. I don't know. I, I really can't, I can't describe it. It's, it's just, there's something about the, the weight of the tournament that appeals to me. Um, uh, but that can be daunting for some fighters. I, and I realize that. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the best thing to tell someone who is an up and comer or is working at getting better is to fight your fight and, you know, make sure that w whatever you're trying to do, that you've trained well enough so that you can execute it and you may not win, but did you fight well for what you were, for the level that you have achieved? You know, we always want to, uh, you know, stand out and, and fight above our level, but technically we really can't, you know, what the, I, I, every once in a while we'll get a lucky shot, but you know, what, what's, I'd rather be uh, lucky than good any day of the week. I'd rather be good, <laughs> you know, and um, I'll take a luck where it comes, you know? Um, and uh, you know, so, and, and it goes back to a little bit about what your goals, healthy goals in fighting, you know, um, uh, it's easy for me now to say that I would, uh, um, um, still be fighting if I wasn't a knight. I mean, that's, it's real easy to say, right. Cause I, I already got my, but I, I think that, uh, it's, it's easy for me to say, um, and it's true for me to say that regardless of where I was at right now, I still want to be a better fighter. And although my, my, my skills have demit my, my physical physical skills have diminished my knowledge of the game has somewhat compensated if i were to fight 40 year old me i think 40 year old me would beat me all right but uh, even though i know more than i did you know for 13 years ago um i think my i'm just physically slower and uh you know that, that's one of the things with, that i realized that i needed to learn to fight was when my when my speed and it was before 40 i wish it had started at 40 <laughs> you know <laughs> but uh it was a, it was before 40. So, um, but I don't know if I can answer that properly. Um, um, but I think it goes back to having healthy goals. What have you trained to do? Um, and if you, if you don't rye or, or meet your expectations, find out why, find out why and fix it, you know, um, analyzing your fight, going back, um, uh, Duke Midian, good friend of mine is, uh, um, really good at analyzing. So, we have uh, Duke um, um, uh, just moving into our, our, our kingdom, um, Dietrich, and he's world class. And so we've been fighting him, and I'm struggling fighting him. And uh, Midian is, is a really analytical fighter. And so something that he – I went down to a practice with him a couple weeks ago, actually the week before I went up to New York. And what's really good when we went to his practice, I think it's always good to have something formal at your practice that you do. And one of the things I really liked that he did was they were doing a drill and I don't know if he had just changed his drill or if he had um, um, always done this, but I did the drill with him. He's, Oh, you're flourishing. And it's really had an impact on my fighting because I do a lot of flourishing. You can do that at C range. You can flourish all you want at C range. Right. The problem is, you know, a good fighter is going to be like, Oh, he's too far away. Right. You know, and uh, the flourish doesn't affect them. So, where most of the kills are happening is at B range. And if you're flourishing, your sword's coming behind you and you're wide open, oh, that's a bruise, <laughs> right? You gotta pay your dues, right? Um, uh, that was from East Kingdom, I think. And uh, um, uh, anyway, you know, if you flourish, 
your uh, um, your your sword's not there to defend you. You know, and I'm like, can I throw the shot without flourishing? And yes, I can. There's times to flourish, and there's times not to flourish. You know, and um, but it, you know, little things like that um, can make a difference in your fighting. So anyway, I hope I answered some. Probably answered some other things too. <laughs> Yeah, I can, yeah. I just kind of want to mention the, uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, people saying, well, it's easy for you to say. Uh, this is something that Rifkin has heard me say, you know, far too many times. You know, when 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 people say, uh, you know, when, when we when we talk about like just that joy of combat and entering crown, just to be part of the process and the and the pure joy of it, and, and you know, and and. People have told me, well, it's easy for you to say because you're a Duke. And my answer to that has always been no. It's like, I'm a Duke because it's easy for me to say. Yeah, good point. And, and you you, you kind of have to get to that point where where you are comfortable with with what your fight is. You kind of mentioned it. Um, and this is something I, I talk about a lot all the time is, is just, just having that confidence to know that I am going to do well in this list. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to win this list, but I'm going to do well. And everybody that I fight is 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 going to have a fight on their hands. And if I if I do that, if I execute my fight as best I can and I lose, then that means I simply got beat by somebody who was just better. Um, yeah. But if, if I go in there and try to be somebody else um, and I and I don't execute the best fight that I have, um, that is where I get I get super disappointed. But. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Duke because it became easy for me to say. Um, we had a question that, uh, um, yeah, we had a question that came in uh, from the Facebook page that I want to throw at you. What is the newest thing that you have added to your training repertoire? Uh, to my training training repertoire or, or, or so training uh, lately, I have gone back and started, you know, working with spear because there's, Basically, I have a shoulder that's done. My shoulder uh, it doesn't allow me. That's why I've changed my style so much over the years. Um, um, I, I do a sword foot forward stance. Um, but what I've, I've changed recently is uh, the retique to the offside. Uh, I've, I've been working on generating the power to throw that retique to the offside and to try to throw it not with the wind up with the back of the sword, but as a snap. And so that's the thing that I'm, I've been working on a lot lately. And uh, it's really uh, uh, my, for training purposes, it's, it's the sharing. It's not really new, but you know, every time I try something new, I, I take a video of it and I throw it at Tarek in our video group. And it's good to have someone who's your foil, <laughs> you know, it says, do this, do that, don't do that. Um, um, but with this, going back to the spear thing, um, and I think it's helped my legs. Uh, I've, I've been training in, in a spear stance um, and just practicing the quick motions. Um, because the two styles that I fight are sword and shield and spear. I can't fight with my left arm anymore. Um, it's just, you know, it, that's why my style is the way it is. Um, and, uh, you know, so with training... Um, I'm still doing push-ups. You know, I'm trying to work on push-ups more. Um, if, if you're talking about hitting the Pell, I haven't really changed anything specifically other than, you know, watching some shot on YouTube and trying it out. So there is something that I have been working on for a while now, and it's uh, Lucan shot. So Duke Lucan, you know, his, his offside body is phenomenal. And so I've been analyzing his shot. And the thing that I've picked up on lately is that his front foot is is – perpendicular to his opponent and he stands that way even though he does a sword foot lead like me i can't seem to get the the angle and but i notice what he's doing is and i this is something i am training on the pill lately is you know the people who look like they're gumby and can just bend with ease they're not bending laterally they're bending forward and their footwork has put them where they're just able to bend over at their waist bending forward and that's why it, don't get me wrong. There's maybe a little bit of Gumby there, you know, but um, putting your feet in the right place. So I've been practicing, you know, what move do I do to get somebody to flinch so that I can step in, have my body oriented the way I want and then throw the offside. So that's something I'm working on right now. And, and it's, I've been working on it for probably 
three months now and it's still not quite where I want it to be. Um, it's, uh, you know, my, it's so much easier to throw a Moline offside or a Retique offside than it is to throw that back cut offside. The back cut offside, it opens you up. It's, um, it's exhausting. <laughs> you know, it's exhausting. It drains energy. But it's when it, the best fighters can do it. And so I, I take a look at what the best fighters have success with. And I say, what is it that I'm lacking? And that's something that I work on. So, so uh, we had a, a couple other questions that came up sure. as, as a matter of terminology. Um, and, and this kind of goes to your point earlier that everybody's got a different name for everything. Sure. Um, so when you're talking about a, a retique, you're talking about an offside with a thumb. thumb okay, so. You know, it's interesting. Um, I think terminology should be like a norm for any training that you do. And, uh, you know, define ABC range, define Molina, you know. Um, but a retique is uh, is an offside. You know, it can be onside, but it's usually when you're hitting with the false edge, the back edge of the sword. When you're doing it um, onside, uh, the retique is this. All right. So you're hitting your right. opponent. They're, they're onside. Okay. Onside is my sword side hitting their side, right? The mirror image. Um, the offside critique is a thumb lead like this, but you can do it palm down, right? Yeah. And I just call that a thumb lead. Um, the palm up critique is this. And the difference is, as opposed to a Moline, um, when you throw a Moline and you throw it at your opponent, your hand ends up between you and your opponent. So you're not always clearing the shield. And the way the, the Moline, the offside Moline, sorry, the offside Moline to the body or leg works is by footwork so you get them to respond they move their shield and then you come back to the offside right a retique is is uh um it's harder to get the power your body has to be there and when you throw the offside retique you have to your your hand is palm up and so you're you're flinging it around i can't really get it in the mirror but you're flinging it around with the back edge um to their to their offside body and you can also hit leg you can hit anywhere um and uh the problem is don't be angry if they don't call it you know um most people that I, I can tell when it's good and i can tell when it's not good when it's good if i think it's good and uh you know someone's not going to call it and i'm like okay their armor works or whatever and you know whatever but but it's still a useful shot for me you know there's times when i will do it and there's times when i won't and that's depending on the person's stance the type of shield they're using um which foot is forward, all those little things that we look for that help us decide which play in my playbook am I going to try right now. So, but the retique is, you know, you can do it onside with the, the back of the sword, or you can do it offside with your palm up hitting with the uh, back of the sword as well. Anyway, I hope that definition makes sense. All right. We also had a question about uh, what do you mean by a flourish? Um, well, I guess I mean, um, oh, by the way, this is not a real knife. <laughs> toy. It's a toy. <laughs> She's like, stop waving that knife so fast around you. <laughs> okay, not a, it looks real. It's not real. Okay. It's this interview is going to end real fast. <laughs> it's it's yeah, going to be short that. real fast. <laughs> that was great. Um, so uh, uh, a flourish is something that... Um, uh, Okay, so a Moline is, you know, the motion of the Moline is this or that, that wind up motion. So when I talk about fakes, I have what are called hard fakes and soft fakes. Um, you know, hard fake is when I do a pump fake, it can be vertical or it can be lateral. And by the way, lateral fakes are phenomenal. They are just great tourney shots. Um, but the, um, the flourish is, you know, we throw that looping wrap shot and the intent is not really to hit anything. That's, that's a flourish, right? Um, if I throw a shot and then instead of bringing it in front and throwing, if I bring it behind my head, right. And sometimes there's a good time to do that. Uh, when you're at range, it's probably okay. When you're in close, not so good. And, um, so that flourishes the, the loopy stuff that I do that, um, when somebody knows how currents fight, they go, whenever current starts doing something, you get the heck out. Um, and I realize that, and that's, that's something that I have to overcome. Right. Um, you know, if I was fighting me, what would I do? I have to think about what I would do if someone was fighting me. And um, I know that people want to get inside on me. 
And the, the worst thing that people can do is chase sometimes because we are, you know, uh, 40, however, however we, we're, we're apes that have been walking with this motion since we were born. And it doesn't matter what you do when you try to move fast. We're not professional fighters that work on I mean, Some of us are, I don't know. I have a job I have to do during the day, but this motion, people make mistakes and that's when I'm going to kill you. So, um, you know, when, when knowing what I do and the flourishes, you know, the, the wind up, the tricky stuff, which I like the SCA because I think it's also a spectator sport. I want, when I kill somebody, I want the crowd to go, Whoa, you know, I like that. That's, that's cool. You know, that, that, that drives me too, you know? So, you know, I, I think it's, it is definitely an intimate thing between two fighters and uh, let the calling be between us. Uh, but it's a spectator sport. You know, it's, it's, it's beautiful to watch when people know what they're doing or, or they have some skill. It's, it's awesome. I love watching it. So just as much as MMA or boxing. So uh, we had another question that came in from uh, Sigurdfith out in the West, um, one of the uh, great fighters, YouTube guys. Oh, yeah, uh, he yeah. said, what was the offside that you said was hard to throw? Okay, well, when I say the offside is hard to throw, I mean that it's, it's, uh, it's not, in general, there's different shots that take more energy. The, the chamber back cut to the offside, it takes a lot of energy. For me, I have just, I'm always, my onside is fine. I am always working on the offside um, because that's where that's where people die. There's no shield there. You know, when I fight a lefty, I have no problems fighting a lefty. Right? Someone's going to get hit, and it's if I have a good plan, um, I'm going to do fine. I do better against lefties than I do righties because righties you got to get around that big shield. Um, and I've also had a lot of squires and and uh, um, uh, squire brothers who are knights who are lefties, and it's it's. I've had a lot of practice against lefties, but um, to me, I think that the offside takes much more energy than the onside. You know, you have to move your body. You have to twist your body, the energy involved. But the shot that I was talking about for um, Bronos's shot, I mean, everything that Bronos does when he does that offside shot is violent movement. It is so fast. And, you know, his, his setup up here, makes you think that you're going up here. The same thing when you do, Sean, when you do that little thing before you come off side body with the pendulum. And that's one of the shots that we talked a lot about. Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of good styles have that similar orientation to it. You know, old gunslinger right here. Yeah. Where am I going? I'm going over there. Where am I going? You don't know, right? From my A-frame, I can do this. My A-frame is charged, so I can do this. I can do a lot of different shots. Um, uh, old castle, <laughs> you know, you yeah. can go anywhere from here. You don't, it looks the same no matter what you do. Uh, but the, the offside, you know, you have the chamber and set it up and, and it's just, I have, it's, it's, maybe I'm just not putting enough energy into it. Maybe I'm not, um, comfortable being at a range, which you have to be at almost to throw it. Uh, he's also using a much longer sword than I use. I think, uh, his sword is 40 inches probably, or 38 at least, um, so those are, uh, when, I, when I say it's hard to throw the offside, I just think it, it takes more energy. Um, I can throw it, but maybe not as good as him, so. Well, I've, I've said for a long time that the offside head is absolutely the worst mechanic in our sport. Yeah, um, it's just hard to do. It's just, yeah, I mean, I mean. Totally agree. Just clearing your head with, you know, without hitting yourself in the head um, and the amount of power that you can get on the offside head is not nearly as much as you can on on a flat snap oh. it is oh, it yeah. is the worst mechanic in our sport but it's also one that you have to have because if i can't attack that upper uh, left quadrant then like that's 25 percent of your targets that i don't have to, oh yeah like, somebody doesn't have to worry about so it's one of those one of those things you have to have but it is it's, a, it's a mess and and it always it boggles my mind you know when when somebody has equal access to to all the head targets you know, like you can hit an offside, you can hit a flat snap, you can hit a wrap. And it just boggles my mind how many times people want to throw the offside head when it is harder to throw. It's, it's a terrible mechanic. And, and, the, and, the, and if you have equal access to the flat snap, which is the easiest shot we have and uh, the, the most powerful shot we have, it's like, why are you going to put that much effort into hitting something that 
is kind of a maybe. And, you and it's a little hit. bit, it's riskier. It's riskier. Yeah. And, and the same thing, you know, I was talking to somebody about uh, Baldar. Now, Baldar has a phenomenal Moliné. He has a phenomenal rap. He just doesn't throw a lot of wraps anymore. He doesn't have to and doesn't doesn't need to risk. When you throw a wrap, your arm is out there yeah. and you're you're open, right? Exactly. Um, you know, knowing when to throw the wrap, when you're in tight and you're using their shield for you, you know, then you could throw a wrap and you're a little bit safer. But, um, you know, some people throw wraps at, at, at the wrong time. And uh, if you don't have to throw a wrap, don't throw it. It's all you know, about risk it's, management. It's worse on your elbow too. So, well, and it's, it's all about risk management. You you, you don't yep. you know too many people go out there and they they haven't figured it out yet. So you know they're throwing stuff and there's a lot of risk in just throwing stuff. There's a lot of risk when you're when you're dropping deep to the offside and you're putting your yep. body in a poor position. You know it's you know it, maybe it's not great. You know we we talk about this as a, a habit. Uh, you know, a lot of people are like, but it's not fun just throwing, you know, working these perfect shots and and leaving the risk out and and working to fight before you throw something so that, you know, you're safe and, and effective. You know, I just want to go. And I'm like, hey, that will, you know, that's, that's nothing wrong. That is fun. It, letting it letting it fly can be fun. Um, I, I find, you know, me and Ron Gulliver talk about it a lot. It's like we find winning fun. So, you know, that yep. does. Hey, if it's, if it's what do you have fun, to do to find your fun, I guess. If it's just for fun, let me win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say win, winning is fun too. It is, you know, as long as you do it the right way, right? So yep, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm gonna throw this way back because uh, this is gonna go back just because I'm interested. So you started in '91. When did you get knighted? Ninety-eight. Uh, and then when did you win crown, your first crown? 2005, I think. Okay. I think so some, definitely some time through there, right? Oh, yeah. Like I said, I fought in a lot of crowns. And, uh, um, you know, I think it was it was probably mental, but it was um, – I just wasn't as, as good of a fighter. You know, I think there's a little bit – you know, there's a little bit of that. I, You know, were, were they – genetically superior to me or you know i was in great shape you know i made i made martin a duke i was in the finals my first finals whenever uh was i lost to martin twice in the finals very close um and within a couple of years of each other and um you know he had told me that he goes current you're faster than me your technique is good but uh i had spent months because i knew there was a chance i was gonna if i got to the finals you would be there as well and he said, I had spent months figuring out what I would do when I fought you. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I'm a, like I said, the fight happens when it happens. Um, I don't know if I've ever, I mean, I have now after fighting people, uh, do I have things, do I know that things work against them better? Like certain shots have a higher percentage against that person based on their shield, based on their, um, the way they hold their sword. Um, yeah, a little bit, but that's probably from experience. Uh, Martin, like I, when I was telling you about earlier, is just an analytical fighter. And um, I, I, to me, that was amazing. You know, and it, it changed. That was when I started getting to the finals of Crown. It, I, I, I was like, man, I want to win this, <laughs> you know. And, uh, um, you know, I, I had to start thinking, I guess. I, I will say that like, going back to what I said earlier is, is the first Crown, I was in just great shape, though. You know, I, I ran around people and just hit them before they could touch me. And, uh, you know, being in shape does make a difference. Um, it, it, you know, being strong, having, you know, strong calves, strong thighs, strong shoulders, you know, um, uh, you don't have to be a muscle bound, but you have to be, um, you know, you have to have some strength to, to do it and it helps. So. What, what was the other part of the question that you had? I can't remember if I, if I, don't know if I answered that. You said when I won the first crown. Um, no, you, you, you covered it actually. Okay. You, cool. uh, I asked when you, uh, when you get, when you get knighted, when you won your first crown. Yep. So hey, I, Sean, think, I, I do think like Sean has a question actually now. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, I want to say, Sean, before you go, I do like the way you, uh, I'm going to borrow that. The, um, the idea that our offside 
is the how did you phrase it mechanically oh, it's, it's the worst mechanic in our sport okay and, and maybe that's <laughs> that's what i was was uh looking to describe it because i like i said i'm always trying to get better at it because i struggle at it and uh um i, I think it's just the it inherent mean I nature stop. i'm gonna still work on it <laughs> i'm gonna still work on it you yeah know, but i don't yeah, know like I said, I, but and i'm not using that as an excuse but i, I if i if i do suck at it i'm gonna say sean said it's okay <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, even, even when I, when I teach that mechanic and, and when I teach stick mechanics, you know, I mean, I, I still don't know that I found the best way to teach people how to do that. Uh, it's the best way that I have. Um, but I mean, it, it is. Well, it is that, such... well your, your offside Molinae is, is perfect. Yeah, the, well, right? and the that's Molinae is, that's is different though. That's different. Right. Yeah, the yeah. Molinet is very different from uh, from just a straight off the shoulder textbook, you know, offside head, yeah. right? Um, uh, the offside head is is one of the basic mechanics that I teach. The, uh, the Molinet I don't teach as a basic mechanic because it's no, not. it's not. It it's is not basic. Um, it's, 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 it is yeah. it is complicated. But after after the five basic shots that I teach, which basically really come down to you know shield side, sword side, backside, right? There's the the flat snap, there's the offside, and there's a the wrap, right? Um, there are only two mechanics that I teach really at all. And that's the Moline and then the inverted slot pendulum uh, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, as far as, as far as unique mechanics go, um, that's it. That's all I have. Um, everything else is a variation off of that. And when I throw the Moline, I teach it starting at throwing at the hip, like square right at the hip line, but then I can throw that anywhere in a, in that 90 degree arc from the, from the hip right into a slot shot. And usually when I throw a slot, it comes in, it, it comes in off of a mullet. So I, I noticed that your hand is in the center and that, that's really important because when you, when you throw shots, if you bring it back to the center, you can still go anywhere. If you, if you go right. too deep over here, you can't go back over there. And, right. But if you come to the center point, you can still, you still have options and, and your hand is just naturally doing that. That's something I've also, um, when I train people is come back to that center point, because that's where, where your power in the shot originates. So from here, you can go offside. I can go there, but if I go all the way over, I've committed and I can't come back. So yeah, keep it, keep it, it is risky. Yep. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think the Moline in particular allows for allows that, that a little bit better. Um, cause I know I do mine, you know, tip down where, where once my hand gets above my, my tip, then I'm just turning my elbow in and just rolling it over. And again, you can, can slot it, you can headshot yep. it and you can come off body. It, it's, it gives yeah. you all those options. Yeah. Well, you're talking about when somebody's throwing a wrap, right? Uh, all too often somebody throws a wrap either to my leg or my head. Once the arm goes out, um, I'm like hitting that ball and aim right Block in the shoulder hammer. socket. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it just, and it, and it rolls right into the shoulder socket. Um, I'm not targeting the arm because the arm is in motion. That shoulder socket is a stationary target and I can roll that right into off of a Moline and just pull it right into the shoulder socket. But again, that, that Moline is different from just throwing textbook, you know, off the shoulder, right into the yep. face. And that, that offset head, you have to hit that right in the face for somebody to, to yep. know that they actually got hit with it. Um, and everything I do and to, to get power off of a shot like that is, mm -hmm. It has a so, slightly different mechanic. It's so interesting that when we talk about that offside, and I, I don't want to distract too long, but you know, my my squire says, "Oh, everything over here is a back cut." And to me, there are there's like four ways to throw it. There's you know the the Bruce Lee offside punch. There's the charge back cut. There's the um, your pull the pull back cut where your hips coming back, and then there's the combo. You know, there's those are things that if you don't know they, that there's four ways to throw that offside, you're not going to, you're not going to know to do it anyway. I know you had a question. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, here on the coach's corner, we're kind of interested in uh, training methodology and we've talked a little bit about how you train for yourself. Um, what is your overall training philosophy when you are a, as a teacher? And uh, you, I mean, it sounds like you were a, a teacher uh, mundanely, but, yeah. As a teacher of our sport, uh, what would you say is generally your training methodology for uh, for your students? Uh, I just want to say this to start with, that I am, I've always been really bad at making practice practice. Okay, so, um, and it's probably, uh, I, I do much better at it 
when there is a small practice. And sometimes I uh, like one on one, I have a couple squires and, and guys who want to learn or and uh, who I've met with and and uh, we pull the pels out and we we hit the pell and we we work the shots on the pell and then we go uh, and train. We also do a lot of buffer weapons and this is for selfish reasons, but it's also for them. Um, when I'm trying to do that Lucan shot, right? The only way to do that is to train full speed. You got to train at full speed and no one wants to get hit in the offside body for tonnage over and over again. But the buffer weapon's fine. And I can, tr I can practice the full speed and full mechanic. Um, and so we do that. So we do a lot of buffer fighting. Um, you can do it without uh, um, putting on all your armor. You can just put on your 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 shells. I call them. You know, your what, what, what in football they call them shells. I think whatever. I can't remember what it was when I played football. I played one year. I was a baseball player, but I was like, got to play football once. <laughs> you know, um, helmet, cup, and uh, you know, elbow pads, knee pads, and that's pretty much it. And we play with buffer. Um, although I will say, make sure you still use good knee pads. Tarek broke my kneecap because he hit my shield into my knee. He is from New Jersey, you know. So he likes saying he broke it with a bobber weapon. He like he gets a kick out of that. He goes, "I'm from New Jersey." <laughs> Everything so, is legal in New Jersey. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I, I say that I, I, you know, when I go to a practice, I've actually even when I don't go to a a um, uh, a practice where we're just sparring, you know, and, and we have a tendency, I I could spar and and teach myself, right. Um, try a new style, try a new shot, whatever. But sometimes it's really good to ask somebody, can you behave this way so that I can see when a person does be, you know, do what I want them to do in my fantasy world, that I can do it. Um, and you, you may think that you're giving away to that one person the everything about that shot, but you're really not. Because he's going to tell you if he's, if he's your friend, uh, when you're starting to initiate, it's not working. I'm not, I'm not seeing the fake. So uh, I, I do a lot of training with mirrors because mirrors are instant feedback. And I, I have a Pell in front of a mirror and I do that all the time. Um, when I train others, uh, you know, I, I, basics are, are, are good. Um, and then, you know, organically as, as the fight occurs, you know, so one time I was training one of my men at arms, uh, maybe six months ago, and uh, he threw an offside and then an onside. And I did a, a hanging block and hammered them. And I did it to him a couple of times. And I had trained them to, when you get hit with something the same way, you need to ask a question. All right. So he asked me and I didn't really have a response. I said, well, let's go through it together and let's figure out what you could do. And so we worked it out and he came up with the idea of, after I throw the offside and the onside, I should be moving through because just trying to block it is not a good response because if you train yourself onside, offside block, well, then somebody's going to throw that pendulum underneath into your face and you've patterned yourself. So sometimes moving through the shot so that I can't do the hammer, it's already closed, the door is closed. And I think sometimes when we analyze the fight and you can only do this sometimes when there's a, uh, you know, when you're one on, you know, we're all fighting on one on one, but when there's smaller practices, because when you go to a big practice, everybody wants to fight you, you know, and, um, and I want to fight everybody. And there's times when I, I probably take my teaching hat off and, uh, you know, I still put it back on every once in a while, but, um, you know, basics, you know, don't stand too deep in your stance. There's a lot of don'ts, <laughs> you know, um, I don't train people at a range when they're first starting, you know, don't make that mistake. That's a huge mistake that I think a lot of people don't realize when you're training at a range, you're not seeing the fight. You're not able to do the shots. You know, when everybody starts they're they're, you know, apes swinging a club, you know, and that's, they have to be able to see how it works. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, knowing some things like that about training is really, really helpful. Um, my personal training um, I do, uh, a lot of centuries, um, Earl Thomas, the incomplete from the West kingdom, when he moved to Trimeris years ago, he introduced me to the cumulative effect of doing a century. And I started doing, I've been doing centuries for years now. Um, 
I know there's like a, a big uh, website where they do Century Club and and uh, I, I think it's Brie Allen that runs it. And she's like, Kern, thanks for promoting that. And I was like, yep, uh, no problem, because it's, you know, I, I'm sure but I haven't really promoted it. But she said, giving her some of the ideas. And I said, I can't take the credit. <laughs> I got it from Thomas. And uh, the cumulative effect of, of doing a Century, um, even if it's just 100 shots, and I don't even do 100 shots always, it's 100 moves. You remember when you talk about tension, Bronos, you know? And it's yep. it's a hundred moves. I don't have to throw a hundred. Yeah, well, that's back. That's that, exactly. You and that goes into that that space where it's like, you know, a lot of people think that it's every, you know, that it's a hundred shots. Well, it could be two fakes in a shot. It could be exactly. one fake in a shot. It could exactly. You know, you you can kind of could be a, a slide in a shot, yep. and and those actually even a slide and shot could be done at the exact same time. Yeah. But I do, uh, you know, I, I go to the gym. Um, I do my treadmill. Uh, my, I'm sorry, my elliptical, not the treadmill, because my knees are bad. I've had both my ACLs done and my left one hurts all the time. Can't run anymore. I'm good from here to here. <laughs> from long distance, I can't run. Um, but I do my elliptical and uh, then I do my, uh, you know, stretches and then I do my, I think it's important that when you're training that you don't do ballistic stretching, which is stretching without warming up first. You should always do some type of calisthenic or cardio before you stretch because um, you can strain yourself. Um, I do my, uh, my curls. I do my push-ups. I do, because of my shoulder, I had unsuccessful rotator cuff surgery. I just do simple bands, you know? Um, I don't do giant weights for my squats. I struggle with them, just body weight squats. Um, and then, you know, my push-ups and I, I end my, every time I go to the gym with hitting the pelt. And uh, I have, luckily, I'm fortunate. The place I have is they let me put one of those wave masters in there and I, um, I hit it and there's a mirror there and it's, it's a yoga room, <laughs> you know, and I got the mirrors and, and I go in there after every, after every uh, gym session, I go hit the Pell. That's and awesome. probably in the, in the last year, I have hit the Pell. I, if I missed 30 days, I'd be surprised. Um, hey, uh, Bess has a couple of questions for you sure. real quick. And uh, no problem. Just check in and see if Misty has something too. Yep. Uh, so thank you, by the way, for the training, because that was one of them. So I'm just going to erase that from my whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, one of the questions you, or one of the things you said, is, and you said it again, is you've had a bad shoulder. So you've had a big injury. So at yeah. that point in time, there's a lot that you can't do. So one of the questions that I've seen here and other places is, how do you come back from an injury like that? So what did you do? Um, cause, uh, not so much physically, because I'll leave that to the professionals to talk about, but mentally, mm -hmm. psychologically, how did you get yourself back in the game after such a substantial injury? So uh, I didn't try to fight it. I changed what I do. And, uh, you know, I, when I first started fighting, I was a strap scootum and uh, gunslinger style. It had some success. And then I saw center grips and something about it just really appealed to me. That was an, that was where I changed my, my, my fighting. I went from strap scootum to strap heater. Not that much of a difference. You got to learn how to block your legs a little better, but then I went to uh, a center grip oval and that was a change that I made with, with, without injury. That was uh, just a, uh, uh, a style uh, period stance, uh, period decision. And, um, it just, it looked like I was inspired by it. Um, as the injuries went on, I blew my knee out. Um, I, and then I had my shoulder problem. Um, when I blew my knee out and I also have, I have tendinopathy and I have neuroma, <laughs> you know, I'm broken. Right. So I've had, I've done the math. All right. And, um, you know, originally when I was fighting with the, the center grip, um, and you would think of oh, center grip is actually worse on your shoulder. It depends on what you, how you hold it. So, when I switched from a, a shield foot lead to a sword foot lead, um, yeah, I couldn't hold it out anymore. I think um, um, Ron Valder, he does a very square stance a lot of times, and he holds his stuff out there. And if I could do that, I would, because he catches everything out there, right? And I think that's really smart. If I'm describing Ron Valder incorrectly, I figure Bronos can tell me that. But he looks <laughs> more square than I am, you know? Um, and, and it does give him options and he's, he controls range. Um, I don't think I'm as fleet a foot as Ron Balder, 
But um, when my when this shoulder went bad, um, I switched to a, a, an A-frame stance. And so my stance is my shield is high, you know, holding my my shield here, my center grip. And it looks like my shield is really tabled out. But if you watch Sean fight, it looks like his shield is really tabled out and he's that leg looks wide open, but it's not. All right. Once you learn the range, you're fine. And by me holding my shield up here, I'm taking away the flat snap. And that is should be everyone's fastest shot. You know, and so I'm taking away the flat snap. Now you're going to have to go offside. If you go offside, so I'm going to see you. I'm going to, I'm going to make you pay for it. All right. Um, if you go offside, my, my a frame is right there. So I've had to change, um, you know, what I do. And the other thing about having the sword foot forward, when I, the reason I changed the sword foot forward was because when I was doing an a frame with a, um, with a uh, shield foot forward, I was getting my leg tagged. You know, it, I just couldn't with my shoulder. I couldn't keep up. And I don't even know if my shoulder wasn't bad, if I could keep up. I just hadn't dedicated enough time maybe to get to controlling the range. But when I switched to a sword foot lead, now my, my shield leg is farther back. You're going to have to really develop your movement. And if you do, I'm going to make you pay. All right. And if you're going to go for the offside, I'm going to see it. It's a big developing shot and I'm going to make you pay. So there's a little bit of math involved and, um, you know, I, my journey in fighting has been some of it intentional, some of it I was forced to do because of injuries, and I bet you everyone here has a similar story in regards to that. Um, you know, we we have to. Our our game is you know uh, when you think of the virtues, um, and what the virtues of chivalry and um, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you're a knight or not. If you put on armor, you are my brother, you are my sister, you are in the club. There's only so many of us that do this weird shit. So <laughs> I don't care if you're a squire, you're a man at arms, you are my brother, you are my sister, you are in the club. But um, when we think of the, the virtues and, uh, you know, I look at all of them with a martial slant. And, and I don't think that, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, all virtues are being equal. There is one conspicuous virtue of a knight and that is prowess. And so I look at all of the virtues with a, martial prowess slant, you know, a martial fighting slant. So large S, we give our opponent the victory. I could say no. Large S, we give our body to this game. Hello, look at that bruise right there, right? <laughs> look at my injuries, right? Look, I've blown my ACL and I've torn. So, you know, we can look at at this game as, uh, um, you know, how we, how we recover and injuries and things like that. But if you really want to do it, you'll find a way, you know? Um, you just got to have the drive. Now, there's some injuries that I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say there's nothing you come back to. It's just like the teacher in me. I don't want to say that you can't do something. But there are some times when maybe a, a, an honest, you know, talk about what they're doing and you can't do that part anymore. You know, you're going to hurt yourself. So got at our age, you got to start having honest conversations with some of our friends. If they have trouble walking around in their armor, you got to tell, you know, we worry about your friend's uh, health and safety. The reason why some of us can still fight is one, we, we do our best to try and keep the weight off. You got to stay slim. You got to try and do that. And I'm not, you know, to your, whatever your weight, your healthy fighting weight is your healthy fighting weight. I know what my healthy fighting weight is. All right. Um, and you got to stay active, you know, and that's how you, that's how you stay. I mean, I don't know how old everybody is, but I'm 53. If you don't want to say your age, that's fine. <laughs> Bronos, you can keep that to yourself. <laughs> but uh you know my friend Tarek is going to be 60 in a year hey, that's although, awesome. I mean, although we were when we were crowned we granted everyone that was in the order of the gray beard an extra year so technically he is 60 now so <laughs> well, I, know, I know we've all been knighted for at least 18 years okay yeah, right. I, think, I think Rifkin is, 20... I think Rifkin is the junior at just under just under two decades just under yeah right <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna start wrapping up here. Um, uh, we're we're getting on to to seven thirty my time. So uh, it has been really really fantastic conversation, Kern. I really appreciate you coming on and giving us your time um, and 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 
talking about it. Uh, it's your, your passion for the sport is, uh, is very clear. Um, and of course, you know, we all share that kind of passion. So we, we, we know what it's like. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the, one of the gifts that we've had over the last couple of years is, is, you know, with the coach's corner is being able to just take a Friday night and, you know, sit down and talk with our buddies about, uh, yeah. Uh, about all this so uh i riff in or, or best i don't know if you guys have any uh any final thoughts i'm good thanks all right yep. all Can right because uh, i'll keep talking all right well <laughs> Kern, you, you, do you do you want a quick wrap up i guess and uh, just some some final thoughts um just thank you very much i'm, I'm humbled to to be invited on here um you know i it's interesting when we when we have a certain opinion about fighting and we and we say something um, and someone has a totally different take. And don't let that stop you. And the reason I'm saying that's Bronos, there's times when we're on that, that video group where I've said something and you've said, I don't see it that way. And I've listened and I'm like, interesting, you know, and, and I, I think that it's really important that uh, when it comes to fighting, that we're really open to listening yeah. to each other. Uh, yeah. And it, and and Bess, uh, um, Elizabeth, you said that something similar to that, which was, you know, um, uh, listening to your listening to what their goals are or something. I think something like that you said, and learning from from people that are new. You know, uh, when I I do classes with people and and uh, I've done individual Zoom classes, and you know, I want to know what they're working on. What is it that they're working on, and how are they doing it? What's the reason for doing it? Cause I may get something, I'll get something out of it. I'm a little bit selfish. And, and, and so I'll end with that. Be a little bit selfish, but in the right, in the, for the right reasons, you know, uh, do it so that you can help others, you know? Um, but, uh, hope that didn't come across the wrong way. <laughs> no, no, I, I think you're, you're yeah. nailing it, man. Um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, the big piece, uh, I would tell everyone out there, uh, if you haven't had a chance, um, Kern is, is travels all over the place. Get get some time with him. He's an incredible guy. Thanks. Um, and he'll make you uh, want to learn. And uh, because he's always, it doesn't matter if you're a knight or not. He's he's always there looking to learn something because each and every one of us have something that we do well. And I think that's the that's the piece that everybody re- needs to remember. And and if you do something well, share it. You know, and uh, and it, it it's only going to help you actually uh, maybe even do it better in the future. And, uh, you know, and by sharing it, it gives you that chance to meet somebody and, and, uh, and develop friendships. And that's what the, the whole group is about. So, absolutely. so uh, Sean, I think we have sure. another episode. We did a little swip, uh, a little yeah. swap on the episodes. Yeah, I had to do a bit of a switcheroo there. Uh, so next Friday, we are doing an episode on the tell um how to read uh body language and figure mm. out uh those those little things that um that people are trying to tell us about their fighting uh something we've mentioned a lot on this show is uh uh it, it's always great when you can let somebody tell you how they want to die <laughs> and uh if you're paying attention to what's going on in the fight uh they will absolutely tell you um and so that that episode is going to be a little bit about that uh, so that's that's next week. Um, I think the cool part is we got uh, Stephen of Beckhamhan on. If if there's anybody that knows how to do that, that's uh, that's definitely him. You know? Yeah, and I'm at, uh, Steve said he's he may not be able to make that one because oh. he's uh, he is in transition. He's on transition. He's moving. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. That's what I heard. Uh, you know yeah, what? It, one way or the other, we'll get him on a show, and uh, he yeah, has it's too much on. talent not to uh, not to get him on something. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, hopefully, I'm not sure if we'll be able to make that, but uh, but that's still going to be a great episode. Uh, we just kind of had to switch things around a little bit. So, um, and as always, we'd like to thank Sive for uh, for filling in uh, for for Vesper and keeping things going. Um, our thanks to uh, Rifkin and to uh, to Bess for joining us as well. Um, it's been been really great. Um, other than that, Kern, thanks again. Really appreciate you. Thanks Everybody for having have a great me. night. Yeah, and, awesome. uh, we'll see you on a Tuesday. We'll yeah, see yeah. you. Yeah, right. we'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. All right, everyone, stay safe out there, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>